I know how this look right, but first, for less than $15 a year, you could access Curiosity Stream on Nebula with the link in the description. Now for the second hook, because you get two hooks in the foreign land, because we just got it like that. Top five Trump tweets that should have stayed in the draft with your host, Tyrone Woodley. Five, inciting violence that would lead to the storming of the Capitol and then deleting it. The MAGA male sapiens saw that tweet and said it's domestic terrorism time. Four, suggesting that being sexually predatory is biology. Republicans, sex crimes. Three, rallying the birther movement for the first black president. Alongside Joe Brogan, mm, great company to be in. Two, denying climate change. I guess Wharton don't teach climate versus weather. And one, retweeting misleading racist rhetoric. It's a lie that Uncle and I about the Brock Don using these certified hood classics as case studies. Cause this ain't the only time that Trump bombastically blew this dog whistle. But this one right here, it touched my heart like a cardiovascular doctor. Cause this statistic has been used and abused by certain common colored folk them. And Trump, despite looking like he give a orange rim job, is yet the latest in Caucasians that weaponizes rhetoric that black people are predisposed to crime. My big non-binary folk them, my big woman them, my big man them. I never really thought I'd say this, you know, but I miss that man. Don't get me wrong, you know, Biden got ample mean potential. By that time, did he get so distracted that he wandered off stage? Thank you for joining us as well. But Trump was special. Actually, I take that back. I don't want to insult my special folk. Then. With tweets like these, Trump gave us an invaluable insight into the racist underbelly of America. Not only by saying it, but revealing the amount of America that actually believes in it. And this statistic right here is the draw fall. The Trump presidency had people self-reporting and confessing to damn near everything except for 9-11. And speaking of confessions, I got one to make myself. Let me tell you something. All I ever wanted in this life is sin was to get the hell out of Iowa. Like instead of a Popeyes or a KFC being down the road, guess what we have? A restaurant called Hickory Park. Literally hicking the name. And the dish of the day, redneck surfing turf. Like you literally can't make this up. So the only thing standing in my way is this thesis that I literally have negative motivation to do. I'd much rather write a thesis for YouTube than write a thesis for academia right now. All of a sudden, it starts snowing in the dead of April. So I speed run through this thesis cause ain't no way I putting on Chelsea boots in the middle of April. And after celebrating a successful thesis defense, as well as my birthday, you'd expect me to be happy, right? Psych, you thought. Instead of a shout of rejoice, there was just a sigh of relief. Because despite being happy about where I was, I wasn't happy about how I was. It got harder for me to press record. My fingers wouldn't move over the keys with ease like they would before. And I hadn't been to practice in over a month. I began to wonder if this is what burnout really feels like. And I'm frightened for what we about to do today. Cause we about to go to practice after a month long hiatus. There's a lot at risk here. Not only my ego, but my actual limbs. There we go. Oh my so I walk in this thing like Pootie Tang, right? Cause you can't let your teammates see your all courage, the cowardly dog up. But all I try to do is make it through this practice without a white belt trying to give me a second circumcision. Pause, cause that joke right there was the equivalent of eating corn the long way. All I saying is white belts try to take advantage of upper belts when they come off of a break. And I have this unhealthy habit of winning all the time. I'm addicted to winning, sue me. So I could see the ideas that come into their head of finally beating me, right? But not everything that goes through your head is a good idea. Ox JFK. So today I'm foreign. I'm gonna finally do what I've always wanted to do, which is try to train and see how long this stays in my head. I see in the far distance, Walmart brand Bradley Cooper over there drilling with Clint Eastwood. And since I start demonstrating probably the most homoerotic choreography I ever see. So I thinking, okay, I about to get off easy. But little did I know that was about to get ugly at a Woody Harrelson. I fighting the oldest boy in the dojo. Like I telling you, this man look just like Colonel Sanders. And I choke man out like the tattletale strangler. Like this choke was so nasty that I couldn't even put it in the video because YouTube would have probably flagged it as an ISIS propaganda video. And I ain't really even get to feel good about that one because let's be real. This man about one year away from the geriatric ward. Of course I was gonna beat him. This man can't even beat him me. So since they pair me up with great value Bradley Cooper. And you know that's about to be a bloodbath. This boy weigh a hundred pounds less than me. So Bradley trophy legs. And I was like, bro, damn. Buy me dinner first. But little did I know that that was a trap. Bradley going for my legs. But he must see forget that I got more cake than a bakery. So I mean, I wasn't going down that easy. But boom, I go down just like that. Pathetic! It's 
Salam man on top of me look like he's trying to give me the Glockmatic 2000. Pause man, time out, red card, drawing it. It's looking bad out here for me. Cause if this was a real match, I'd be losing. I had to get out of this. So I did what any reasonable person in my position would do. The goals gym bench press and I launched this man into the nether. So dramatic that the camera ricochet off my head but you can still see in the distance I spam an L2 R2. Now at this point you could call me an enema. How my knee on this boy belly making him like Caitlyn Bennett. He ain't like that though. So he electric shied and I was like uh uh uh. I pin this man to the mat like he has pinned a tweet to your Twitter. Notice how I try to isolate his arm for my signature move, the Kimura. And for you all that don't know what a Kimura is, basically I try to make man an amputee. I love Bradley you know. But in this very moment, I trying to put him in a grabber leaf like it's 420. He's trying to put Bradley face on a shirt like it's merch. If Bradley ain't on the news by 7 o'clock, I fail. Like I trying to have Bradley daddy make a go fund me. Alright, we get the point, you're violent. Bradley escaped a little bit, but I catch him. And I was getting a little mad, so I did something so wicked that I turned into a cop mid-fight and turned the body camera over. So that's two ops done. I trying to leave now. I like Scarface, you quit while you're ahead. But since I can say, since you want bully people, we fighting now. My belly start brock dancing. We about to bow in and I literally feeling like Mr. Krabs. And I don't know if it's because I just fight two man back to back. And my cardio so that I just ain't used to this level of exhaustion anymore. But after I bow and bring my head back up, my whole belly felt like an active volcano. I go on off mat. This boss battle was gonna have to wait. The fight music died down a little bit and my health bar going back up. So I was finally ready to get GG'd by my sensei. We bow in and proceed to party cake. Then all of a sudden, this man dropped his knee quicker than Lewinsky. My face going straight into the mat and we fortunately lose cams because I want you to see me like that. I want you to see that. That was terrible. Man starts swinging on my arm like Tarzan. But you know the song? You know the adage? If you first you don't succeed, dust yourself off and try again, try again. So we grappling, right? We trying to get grips. And since they commit just a little bit too much, and I start looking like the dog in the box seat or the dog with the sinister simple. Because me, being a judoka, had the opportunity for an insane hip throw. One that may tip the odds in my favor. So I attempt this drop throw, right? And instead of him being behind me, where he's supposed to be, right? Tell me why this boy was on the side of me. Man, must he bury Allen? I feel my collar getting tighter and immediately get hereditary PTSD from the days when we was getting hanging in the trees like ornaments. So you know, the current day. 50 years ago, I would have pulled you out of there and hung you I gripping on his hand like this, trying to get it off my blood clot neck. But it was already too late. Sensei do me like a beep big corner. Now it's 0 for 2. I really out here looking like Tyrone Woodley. With the jab and he came with the right hands. This is my last chance for redemption. I get the master grip on the master himself. That's a win. A teardrop forms in my left eye. I begin to bask in the rarefied air that is here. At this bank and shoal of time, I have the ultimate grip on my opponent. Suddenly my stats shoot right up like a white boy at school. But things take a dramatic turn for the worse. When he falls to his back and does this move straight out of a Minecraft montage. Just one take a moment, right? Let me just take a just take a second, just take a beat to watch me get ratioed in real life. My boy face probably look like the Poggers emote right now. This is probably how Jesus felt when all of his boys suddenly gone missing when he was getting nailed to the flicking cross. Sensei put the wickedest armbar on me and sound itself began to fade away. And in that moment, all I could think about was the dynamics of the situation. I'm fighting a man double my age and half my size. If we was just comparing numbers, I would be estimated to win. But that's the nuance that statistics miss. There's three kind of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Mark Twain, or the British Prime Minister. Who care, he probably stole that anyway. My thesis was a qualitative study, and academics hate that. So at my defense, the questions that were brought up were aimed at impugning the validity of my research on the basis that it wasn't numbers based. But my argument is that so much of science aims to sterilize situations into their most isolated elements that ultimately miss the nuance and the subtleties of those situations and leads to ill-informed conclusions like these. And it'll sound daft to say, and I'm probably gonna get counseled for it anyway, but Trump isn't culpable for this. Trump is a pawn and a victim as well as a benefactor of white supremacy. Because this institution permeates so many different perspectives and maligns so many experiences much like the problematic classic, Belly. I'm so excited. I'm so excited right now! These movies are very problematic. Damn! You lying. Unk. 
In a time where Unc and I only had about 2k subscribers and we were still link dumping in our bread too, we had this crazy idea for a collab. Dissecting two canonical hood films that I had absolutely no idea was this problematic. But they are both pregnant with so much commentary relating to this conversation on black crime. Starting with Belly, where moments like these are unfortunately in abundance. Literal, his literal <laughs> lines are, I'm a bad man, I kill people, yes. I make money, don't fuck with me. I run shit, <laughs> I kill for nothing, and I make lots of money, I deal with the business, don't bring that shit to me. Belly is where American black crime meets Jamaica. Made by none other than Hype Williams, who is very much hip hop Michael Beck. Somehow he gets the deal to make a movie. So he decides I'm gonna make a long ass rap video starring rappers. <laughs> With hip hop becoming the burgeoning cultural zeitgeist, competing and inevitably conquering rock due to its inability to innovate. Rap stars were transcending rap and becoming movie stars. Poorly acting movie stars, may I add. Nas and DMX aim to show two sides of the black criminal enterprise. And as Unk mentioned in his Black Boyhood is Hell video, which this is pretty much a companion piece to, there's always this sociopathic character that plagues the plot in these movies. And this would naturally be no different. Despite black crime art being treated differently than its white counterparts. There's no belly, there's no power. I'll just say that. Belly made stylized black crime noir possible. Belly takes great influence from Goodfellas. This is not unique to black people. Belly doesn't exist without Goodfellas. And Westerns um, before that. This point is critical to understanding how black crime is mystified. It's assigned magical properties in order to other it from other types of crime. It's not hard to find examples of Westerners describing crime in the Middle East and Africa as barbaric. Or even claiming that other countries have electoral crimes and don't have fair and free elections. When not only are these very Westerners calling the kettle black, because the cacosity to call any election unfair after your own. The Imperial Invader Starter Pack has OP violence as a crucial component. And who does imperialism better than the West? But you know what? Let me be charitable. Black crime is different, and I'm about to tell you why. Now, there's not much in this film that's appropriate for you two, because I could scrub in any direction and still ask the question. You think I can show this one? <laughs> there's nothing I can show this one. Like, stop when, when, it, when the, the worst part happens. But Nas and DMX are ruthless kingpins of a drug enterprise, and we see their descent into dysfunction. But the funny part about that dysfunction is that function begets dysfunction. Nas and DMX clearly have been failed and systematized and gotten into crime. They start, you know, grooming other young men to be in the same, like, worldview that they have. Nas and La Kid, they wanted to be like us so bad. They was young thugs in training and shit. The irony is that's, this is what happened to DMX. DMX was a young dude that mm. started hanging out with rappers. That's who and that's who got him on drugs. This is the part about black crime that evades so many people. The black poverty rate in the US was 19.5 last year. And you don't even want to begin to look at the poverty rates in the global south, including the Caribbean. Poverty is not a choice and it's not endemic to any experience. It's a byproduct, sadly a desired one, of capitalism. And I say a desired one because how else will rich people subjugate people of a poor class if they have resources? So capitalism manufactures scarcity in order to keep them dependent. Then they exploit your labor. And you know how the song goes because it's a sad song widely sung. And black people around the world are on average less well off than their white counterparts. To the point where blackness is sadly synonymous with poverty. Hence we have terms like black excellence to denote those who aren't poor. Black excellence is the outlier against the default, which is indigenous and parsimonious. And poverty is essentially a breeding ground for crime. And the part that is missed in Nas and DMX's story is that they didn't turn to crime because they're sociopaths. They turned to crime because they would die otherwise. And that was the matrix that turned them into sociopaths. Often people that are unempathetic to this situation negate the origin story and simply see the effect thus ignoring the cause. They see the broken branches and refuse to recognize the roots in order to perpetuate a narrative that black people are sociopaths that kill, loot, and steal. They think that they're like this from birth, thus failing to realize that they may have been born into it. We often don't discuss the grooming of black boys, especially if it isn't sexual. But black boys are preyed upon and recruited for these criminal enterprises, which at the risk of sounding redundant, Unk's video after this one. Don't play with me, it hot. Cause he goes into depth about black boys. But I'll be remiss if I don't discuss 
black girls. So trigger warning for grooming, sex trafficking, all of that. So the goal is to make us see that DMX is an awful person at the beginning of the movie. And let's be real, a nigga like DMX in real life, hell, DMX in real life, would have a 16 year old side chick. There were men then and now grooming teenage girls yeah. with, with flash and, and gloss. But it's it was one thing to like, see it within the first five minutes of the movie. Keisha's going through uh, DMX's phone, finds her number, calls her, and they have a catty argument. She goes and she just yells at DMX, and then they have sex. And it's just... <laughs> sorry, I couldn't take it. I'm sorry, I couldn't take it. To reward, and I want to use the word reward carefully because it suggests that sex is a commodity instead of something that two people consentingly can enjoy. But essentially rewarding DMX's adultery and predation with sex. It's depicting black women as complacent with poor partner performance. To the point where a rowdy argument about a repugnant issue that should result in either dissolving the union, counseling, or jail. Instead it's not only normalized, it's rewarded, incentivized. Make no mistake. Even though this isn't robbing a store or shooting a gun, this is crime. When we think of this intersection of crime and poverty, we fail to recognize the role that women play in this dysfunction. Whatever blight the human condition faces, women bear the brunt of it, especially black women. Because the frustration and insecurity that comes with poverty and leading a life of crime has to be released onto someone. And oftentimes, it's women that tote that load. And black women, trans, cis, envy, anyone femme presenting is typically the most vulnerable in this situation. Due to how patriarchy will still benefit men and mask presenting people regardless of race and class to a certain extent. Thus these women are typically abused in these scenarios. And that's when they aren't being used as a vehicle to escape poverty. Because then there's literally commodifying femme bodies in sex trafficking. Sex trafficking, the vast majority of it is young ladies who are being exploited because they are highly vulnerable in toxic environments. And they're exploited by a, new, a, a number of different factors in the community. Um, often men like a buns, sometimes their own um, peers, sometimes they, they, they find ways into it themselves because they recognize it as an opportunity. It's, it's, it's gender crime in, in a way, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And then the system, up until a couple of years ago, would charge a 16 year old with a solicitation. Like if you caught a 16 year old with a grown ass man in a hotel room in like 2010, the man would get a lesser charge than the 16 year old. I didn't know that. In America, that. In, in most states. I didn't know They that. just changed that I feel like 2014, 13 in the state of Georgia. It's a very difficult topic to hear as it is to discuss. And I'd very much like to highlight intellectual media. Who's a black woman that speaks to this experience at length and is relevant to this conversation as much as many others. Because women in poverty is an experience that is not discussed enough, especially girls in this environment. We don't want to put the onus on the teenage child for responding to their dire environment. The same way I don't want to criminalize teenage boys that run up in your house. I don't want them to run up in your house, right? Like, I don't want you to be there when people run up in your house. But like, I got a student right now that's serving the last couple of years of a 10 year sentence. They started when they were 17 um, because they were with somebody that ran up in a, 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 a store. It's mm -hmm. 10 years of his life gone for that moment. They don't have the capacity to be an adult. They, they don't. If they are, they're, uh, they're maladjusting to a situation. Capitalism equals poverty. Poverty equals evil. I suck at math. That's why I did poly sci. But even I could understand that equation. And we've seen this scenario play out in an American context. But you know that this channel is all about saving Caribbean culture with commentary. Thus, I must introduce to you Louis Rankin. This part with Louis Rankin where he's talking about um, where he's watching footballers is one of the most awkward scenes ever. We don't even need to watch it because nothing really happens. I mean, it's just... And also, he calls it soccer instead of football. And it just shows me that Louis, Louis Rankin... Louis wouldn't say that. Louis wouldn't have said that, rest his soul. Jamaica's good. Yeah, Jamaica's good. Yeah. Jamaica's very good. I struggled immensely with this part of the video because 
It really needs its own. But the way the Caribbean-ness is used as a focal point to juxtapose black American criminality highlighted a concept that I can only call the black American gaze of the Caribbean. Louis Rankin is depicted at this hyperbole of criminality. I run shit. <laughs> I kill for nothing. And I make lots of money. The contrast of shades in the black diaspora is a very polemic discussion. So let me know how bad you want a video of this because I ain't gonna make it for no reason. It's a very dangerous topic to talk about. But from the onset, Jamaica is demonized in this film. It's reported that this heroin is dramatically more potent than previous forms of the drug. So much more, in fact, that the user need only apply the drug externally on the skin to be affected. US DEA fears the drug's on its way to this country via various conduits in Jamaica and throughout the West Indies. We'll have more on the story as it breaks. That's the news for now. Stay tuned for more later here on MTV. They need some shadowy place in order to justify the events that follow. And they foreshadowed the criminal haven that is Jamaica. We often have white people misrepresenting Caribbean stories. But in the case of Luke Cage, and now this, one would wonder why a black movie made by black people for black people would otherize Jamaicans. Many of us probably came from the same region in West Africa. So why the need to make Louis Rankin so much scarier than DMX, who's already as scary as it gets? Answer, because white America has already otherized other minorities, leaving who for black minorities to other. It reveals this hierarchy of marginalization. And this ain't gonna be no pain Olympics type of thing, because after being here in the States for eight years, I can honestly say that white people don't care that I'm from the Bahamas and FD from Chicago. We both could get the same treatment that George Floyd get if the wrong white cop stop us. However, I maintain the point that at the end of the day, the black American is still American. They do have American privilege and I'm not afraid to exercise it. Just watch my video on Kalina Collier, a black woman from New York with Jamaican heritage who faked being kidnapped in a Jamaican hotel and subsequently rallied an entire boycott of an entire country that depends on tourism all to get some IG clout. Or more recently, a young man that went to the Bahamas and almost drowned in one of our water parks after ignoring the multitude of signs that were plastered all over the park, then aimed to spark outrage and then drag the resort because they didn't. Y'all need to make it a little more louder than 12 feet. After getting out, I did see small signs in the inner pool saying 12 feet. Both Americans in this case weaponized social media and cancel culture as it were. And maybe they didn't realize that stunts like these can hurt the GDP of countries that rely on people coming to those countries and spending American dollars. And that by drumming up negative press can literally disenfranchise a country monetarily. Despite black Americans being marginalized, treated as second citizens in the United States, in their own country. Black people from outside of the states are typically rendered two different treatments. They either get the exotification and the parroting of their culture by black Americans. So me personally, I've received a lot of wagwans and yamans from my black peers in the states. Or they get the you're not black enough treatment. But the fact that there are some cultural variances between black Americans and other people from the black diaspora who sometimes don't meet the standard of being black because they haven't watched Friday or eat chitlins before. I got a mixture of both as well as this last one which is the condescension from black peers. Microaggressions from people that look just like me who believe that our countries are inferior due to infrastructural problems or we have corruption and we live in the dregs, so we go to school on dolphins, so we live in huts. And I want to be clear that the reverse is also true as well, where other people in the African diaspora are very critical of black Americans. But this is the black on black crime of marginalizing one another. These are branches of the same root. There's a mythological element of Caribbean black masculinity <laughs> that I think we have certain goggles for because, and we've talked about this because y'all were, we don't, y'all don't have the same colonial experience that we have, where you don't have to live with your colonizers. Yeah. So there's an absence of a certain type of fear. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then there's a presence of a certain demonstrative, like, essence that we almost fetishize. And I think that's what's coming through here is that we, we wanted mm. um, Rankin here to ox to be scary as shit because he survived a real like slum when they drive through jamaica and they say like you think you from the slums this is the real slums mm -hmm. you know so it's like this paradox ultimately these misconceptions as well as the mutual marginalization of other black people by black people stem from anti-blackness which is taught 
in American schooling, as well as white supremacist revisionist history lessons that I've learned in my own education system. Institutions have been built in the name of securing and fortifying, buttressing and bolstering that institution of white supremacy. It needs the diaspora to be at war with one another. It's the same understanding of dividing and conquering the African continent, the African pie. There needs to be internecine bloodshed in order for this bigotry to continue to live like a vampire that sips on the spilt blood of blackness. Which is why Jamaica is depicted so cartoonishly dilapidated in this scene. I'ma just show you all so you all can take it in for yourself. Man and grow. You have to, you have to pick up the gun down your stuff to, to survive, see? And you have to be the fittest of the fittest, you know, Hold see? On. To survive. But because you see a man live like a king in a man. I just want to pause. I just... <laughs> they got the baby. They got the baby with the gun. <laughs> what I didn't understand then that I get now is that he's trying to get on. It's the same mechanism of grooming for black boys. He sees a opportunity to escape poverty through criminal enterprise. Listen, <laughs> Belly was bad, and this is why. It tries to be this, like, commentary on, like, uh, black poverty and crime and, like, the plight of black people, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other hand, it's like this ridiculous over the top fantasy where the where at some point in the movie DMX uh, dresses up as a homeless Rastafarian to be an assassin. That was DMX. But even so, I still don't know what is more problematic, Belly or Shortus. He just he just pulls he just pulls it out of his out of his um out of his bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> he just took a shower. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've never watched this movie until preparing for this video. However, I've heard excerpts from it in multitude of rap songs. That's how seminal this cult classic is to not only Caribbean culture, but black culture in general. We got to get props to Shatas because Shatas was independent. And Shatas never had a theatrical release in America. Shatas literally came through the culture. You had to get Shatas from somebody in the barbershop. Shatas is influential for good reason because it's essentially Caribbean violent porn. There's scenes and plots in between the violence, but the movie itself is violence. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Where Belly tried to make some social commentary as well as being a black crime noir, Shatas knew what it wanted to be. A very violent hood movie. And the tough part for me personally is that I can't blame this one on anything else but ourselves. They didn't have too much of the American gaze in mind. I think mm. that this was optimized for Caribbean consumption. Definitely, the definitely. fact that it didn't have a theatrical release that you just told me about, I didn't realize that. But the fact that it, like you had to go around here, the cult... The cult um, classic status that this has was in spite of every choice that it made in what it mm. is. It's a scene that I hate because it could have easily happened in the ghetto in the bombers. Where young Wayne and Big stage a lick, which is, you know, a, a crime endeavor. On, I don't know, is this a milk truck driver? What are you doing? My yard is here. Man, what are you doing? You all right? Give me the money. Why well, put that thing away, man? I, I hurt somebody with it. The money, give it to me. One of them throws themselves in front of the truck, acts like they're hurt. The truck driver proceeds to come out of the truck in altruism and fear for the kid that's on the floor in front of the truck. And then the other little rap scallion kid come out with a gun, pointing it at the boy and tell him to give him all of his money. What are these boys supposed to be doing right now? They're in the same clothes this whole like two or three days. They have no shoes. Holy they shirt. They count their money by candlelight. Um, Biggs has on half a shirt. But but the thing that sticks with me is that they robbed him to eat. You know what I'm saying? People think of crime as a moral defect when crime is predictable based on an environment's uh, circumstances, on the resources within it. There's a criminal class of which black people are unfortunately in high attendance of. But the saddest thing about this scene uh, apart from the milk truck driver getting shot for no damn reason, is that this is the introduction that we have to Wayne and Biggs, which can suggest to the unlearned eye that these kids, black kids from the Caribbean, 
are damned from their spawn point. The entirety of their time from spawn point to spawn point is um, just evil. And it makes it Murder seem like, oh, okay, exactly. And it makes it seem as though like they are damned from, from birth. And the point I really want to get across here is that rarely is someone born evil. You have to teach someone to be a demon. And the teachers of this are typically poverty or a society that demonizes you by virtue of your color and characteristics. Which is why we need to check the way we talk to children because we could be speaking to them from the assumption that they're no good. For generations, black adults have talked to black men in some of the least effective types of ways for the behavior they seek to elicit. When I was a teacher, hearing the way some other teachers talked about the children, you know, because the children were bad, right? And then they say, you know, we can't get nowhere as a people because we so backwards and da 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 da. It goes back to what I was saying about the girls that were caught up in sex trafficking that mm -hmm. you can't take a child who's being trafficked and then say, you are the criminal element in this equation. You're like, being no. grown, you're being fast. Surely this child would not want to be or do this. And so this is why those chosen family bonds can be so powerful and unfortunately uh, volatile. And that's something the Rosie is rumping throughout this film. The fact that you have a Jamaican film made by Jamaicans and it ends up being shortest, meaning that we are writing our stories like Caribbean people. Why are we subjugating ourselves in our own story? It's like dying in one of your own dreams. I wanna talk about how you literally have a Jamaican writing this and they still put themselves in positions of of being oppressed or, or at least not in the same social stratification. You can easily find um, black, a black business. A black, <laughs> black business. There's, of course, it's a predominantly black country. This scene shows Mad Max, probably one of the most sociopathic Caribbean characters I've ever laid eyes on. Killing the Chinese business owner. I'm not like that. For you, me, whoever grievance. Yeah, I you know I keep you in the bargain. So yeah, yeah, me. Max, done him. Jesus Christ. Now, the role of Chinese in the Caribbean is a very tricky subject. It's a very nuanced experience because Asians also belong to a marginalized class. Yet they exist a little bit above racially black people, especially in the Caribbean. Because they're not white folk who literally colonized the Caribbean, but they do have access to some benefits given their proximity to whiteness. Despite very much being in the community, in many cases, pillars of the community in ways that white people have not. We have this terrible phrase in the Caribbean where we say, we go into the Chinese, meaning that we're going to the grocery store. And there's this intermingling of cultures due to a myriad of different migration matrices. But one in particular, and an interesting one at that, is how China does diplomacy, which is a phenomenon that as a political science, I've looked at quite a bit. When Americans allude to the fear that China is exporting communism. They fail to acknowledge, probably on purpose, that they are doing the same packaging and exporting for their own ideologies. And they did so rather aggressively across the world. When Americans do diplomacy in the Caribbean, they typically do it in the lenses of hard politique. So they buy a fleet of vehicles for the police for instance. On the negative side, they threaten to take away aid when you don't do what they want you to do. But when the Chinese do diplomacy, they invest in public goods. For instance, they exported their construction companies to the Bahamas to build a stadium that the people of the Bahamas can benefit from. But make no mistake, the Bahamas, as well as many countries in Africa, are pawns in geopolitical warfare. America does not want Asian influence or Russian influence in the Bahamas because it's right off the coast of Florida. So many third world countries benefit from this enmity between America and China. And I'm fully on board with it. Former colonies, get your coins. If the global South would rally together and pressure the former colonial powers to reinvest the labor that was stolen from many of these countries in the global South under the threat of causing up to communist powers like China, Watch how reparations will pass so quickly. But that's a tangent. Back, back to shorters. Wayne and Biggs also rival with this white politician with a surprisingly good accent. Oh, what can I do to cool things down? 
I don't want you and Officer Lang going at it, you know. <laughs> it's giving British expat that married a local Jamaican woman and ended up patriating into the country. But Wayne and Biggs end up killing this politician after he tried to kill them. And this exchange lent some insight. This politician was bought by criminal enterprise, revealing how capitalism corrupts politics. Many of these hierarchies are pay to play to the point where, I mean, this isn't really a revolution. Meritocracy is a farce. And you can evade any crassi with money, which lends to this discussion of corruption in the Caribbean. There's a scene where there's a shootout with the police. Okay, so you have Mad Max on the bike. All of these police show up. We don't even know they police. They pull up in normal cars. That's true. Undercover police. Then you have, okay, so so you have the fellas them shooting at them too. Like you have civilians, criminals of course, but civilians pulling guns on police. If policing is any different in the Caribbean. Sure. Police just pull up and start blasting. Absolutely like, not. Like obviously they'll do that anyway in America, but it, it felt. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> It felt different here. <laughs> Unk. This looks like a very metropolitan area. They look like they're on the high <laughs> They look like they're on the high it's road. A beautiful street. <laughs> there's, there's shrubbery, beautiful depictions of, of there's there's nice roads, which is a very good indication that they're in a good part of the community. And I will confess. Corruption is rampant in the Caribbean. In the Bahamas, you can very well bribe your way out of police ticket. And this corruption has bred a culture of lawlessness. For example, the former prime minister was campaigning during lockdown, <laughs> the same time where everyone, including his own opposition, were told not to congregate, meaning that the opposition had obligation not to campaign. This is a blatant breach of lockdown protocols. And the Bahamian people saw that and voted as Ross out of office. But it contributes to this attitude that if I'ma see my ministers breaking their own laws, why I, as a citizen, would obey them? These are real concerns of Caribbean corruption. Nobody talks about how capitalism is creating an environment that is conducive to corruption thriving. Because if the goal is to gather as much capital as you can, you can't do that without exploiting someone. And capitalism, as well as many very vile vestiges, go hand in hand with colonialism. It's also not lost on me that the woman is pulling out guns and shooting at police on the back of a bike. And that is a dark skinned woman. This is in line with an enduring effort that is the masculinization of black women by assigning them truculent traits. This is a perpetuation of black women being strong by depicting her as the down chick, by shooting ops while they hold your waist on bike back and then die valiantly in an array of ammunition. Or a dark skinned woman that is not only strong enough to survive your pedophilic infidelity, but rewarded with sex so that you do it again, salivating this time like the Pavlovian dog that you are. Yet, in the same breath, uphold, fail, light skinned women. So straight up, like, straight up, there's a total erasure of, of black women in this movie. There's no female characters in this movie. Yeah, you're right. No. You're right. She gets maybe the most lines here and later on in the movie. Louis Rankin is with like two or three different women, but they all get killed. <laughs> and that's the other thing. Like, so women just keep, they're just innocent bystanders. They don't have any lines, but they just keep getting shot. And it's like, y'all could, y'all didn't need them there. <laughs> oh, okay, doing? well, that, that simplifies my argument a lot. I was going to make a whole colorism rant and, and talking about how... Oh, it's still there. Oh, I caught that too. <laughs> the fact that she's, I think she's half Asian. Yeah. Or she's definitely like mixed with something and that's who they decided to spotlight. Yeah. And then you got like um, the the, the God, fair skin stuff. gal here. Wayne won't know what a pom pom size is, a ring size, everything size. I'm like, oh God, like Wayne, come on now. Now mind you, all of these women end up dying at the end of the film. So at least the film is indiscriminate with its misogyny. But the women that have the best treatment and most lines by far are the fair skin women. In contrast to the dark skin women that are literally shotters in shotters and struggle love partners in belly. All of which unfortunately bolster a broken, burning building. And that building is actually an institution. And that institution is capitalism, as well as colonialism, and a little bit of white supremacy. In the age of myths and disinformation, it is important to approach these socio-political issues with science. But you'd be doing yourself a disservice 
if you don't inquest into how it became this way in the first place. If you look at the two opponents and assume that the big guy is going to be the winner, you'll miss out on the fact that what the smaller fighter lacks in size, he has an excess in experience. Which is why it's important to never stop learning and always stay curious. Speaking of curious, this lecture series on curiosity stream blowing my mind. Political theorist Daniel Allen breaking down the political theory behind the Declaration of Independence. I know not everybody here is from the US, so let me just start with a couple of basic details, just reminders. We're coming up on July 4th. July 4th, 1776 is when the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia voted and finally affirmed that they wanted to declare independence from Great Britain. As a political scientist, how many times I can say, as a political scientist, this kept me up with my mouth agape all night. And there's thousands of documentaries like that on Curiosity Stream for you to binge right now. And the best way to access Curiosity Stream is through the smartest bundle in streaming, Curiosity Stream on Nebula. On Nebula, get access to the best in intellectual YouTube like Tom Scott and Legal Eagle. And of course, you get bonus content like the Nebula cut of this video right here with added footage that I can't show on YouTube. Get the best documentaries on Curiosity Stream and your favorite indie intellectuals on Nebula. For only $14.79 a year, you get to support your favorite creators as well as supporting your mental. Top this link in the description. I can see you on Nebula.